that I've been doing over the summer. Um, after a very long time uh, working on stuff, nothing to do with traditional music particularly uh, in my career, over the summer um, I, I spotted an opportunity to work on the effects of COVID on Scottish traditional arts. Um, and myself and a really fantastic colleague of mine called Jasmine Hornerbrook, who's down at Leicester University, we, we pitched in to try uh, and do this study. And so um, one of the things when I was talking to David about what I'd be talking about today and what, where the focus was, is to think about all of the crises that are affecting, um, you know, obviously affecting traditional music in Scotland, but elsewhere in the UK as well. And so what I want to do essentially is I'm going to give a very um, personal view, actually, today of where I think things are in Scotland and also where I think I personally feel future direction and efforts might be worth focusing on. Um, and I just want to sort of say in advance, it's, it's a great relief actually to me, this isn't an academic conference, it is, it's, it, but it is a symposium for us all to get together and we all share a love of traditional music and so on. And so um, I, there's a bit of a health warning on some of this because it is actually just, there's quite a lot of this that's coming straight out of my brain rather than directly from the evidence, which is what I'm normally used to doing. Um, so I'm going to give it a go and, uh, and hopefully you come along with me. Okay. Um, Laurie, are you, can you see the other folk in the hear? No, I've lost the session. <laughs> well, I'm just going to assume that they can hear it. We are recording it, so we can always put it up. But we'll, we'll move on. Um, so the context, um, the context, a lot of us know about the context because um, we watch the news. There's... There's a cost of living crisis. We know about inflation about to hit 10%. Um, there's lots of people worried about things like mortgages. Um, there's a huge raft of things that we know even last week where cost of living is shifting gradually more and more expensive. And that's the first time in around 12 or 13 years that that's really started to happen, that level of inflation. There's obviously a really significant thing for traditional music, which is the aging audiences um, and the aging uh, of the performing community as well, which is something I'm going to talk about today. And this is a real and present danger, if you like, in terms of uh, what future action uh, might be on the table. There's obviously state retreat, so people that um, that work in disciplines like I work with regularly, talk about state retreat. And it's, it's, um, it's a concept essentially whereby a lot of uh, Western governments have been pulling out of um, big government spending over the last 30 or 40 years, 20 or 30 years. And we've seen that in Scotland as well, quite drastically over the 10 years, uh, over the last, well, the 20 tweenies, as some people call them. There's been a massive state retreat massive reductions in uh, public uh, spending and of course austerity as well which we'll come on to and how it affects traditional music is, is I think quite direct. There's been a massive growth in economic exchange in traditional music and that's, that's a really big thing that people have commented on, both members of the TMF have commented on but also other people have commented on elsewhere in the UK and Wales and Ireland as well and in England uh, and that growth of economic exchange is part of the situation where we are now and how do we deal with that. There's also a really interesting problem in Ireland and Scotland at the moment for traditional music which is class consolidation um, and I've been talking a lot with um, some of you know, know Helen Lyons uh, or Helen Lawler in Dublin. Uh, Simon, you'll, you'll know Helen, yeah? And um, so Helen and I are putting together um, a special issue next year, uh, looking at exactly this problem of the upper middle classness of traditional music in Ireland and Scotland and how it's potentially uh, a systemic threat to the transmission of traditional music over the next 10 or 15 years. 
and I'll come on to that. I'm sure what data I've got on that. Um, there's increased barriers to participation. So along with the professionalization of traditional music, what we've seen is the monetization. You talk to fiddlers groups, they have to pay 60 quid to get a hole on a Thursday night. You talk to kids have to pay money to go to a venue to play music. Um, classes are all monetized. Tuition has been monetized to a large degree with the possible exception of pipe bands who remain largely free of, of monetization. But that's something I'd actually be interested to hear people's views on here today. So the barriers to participation, particularly for poor kids, are getting larger and larger over the last 10, 15 or 20 years. And then of course we've got COVID, and uh, that's actually where I'm going to start today, is to talk about the effects of COVID on Scottish traditional music. And all of that, in my view, does actually contribute to this real and present crisis, actually, where we find ourselves today. Um, so, in some respects, one of the questions that's really interesting from, from my perspective is who gets to play traditional music in Scotland? Um, and when you think about that question over the years and over the decades, who's actually part of the performing community and how have they arrived in the performing community? It seems to me that there's been a really silent shift in terms of how people get access into traditional music. And to me, that shift has largely been about the barriers or the financial uh, barriers to learning to play an instrument or learning to sing. And those financial barriers, I think, are increasingly um, getting tougher to negotiate. And it's, the same, it's not just Scotland, it's the same in England. It's also, I think, the same in Ireland as well. A lot of the Anglo-American uh, and, 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 uh, and other countries around there. So the survey that um, uh, I conducted for Creative Scotland on behalf of Creative Scotland in May uh, to June this year was what we call a sampling the river survey, which just means you put it out there and you get a sense of what's happening and then you take down the survey after four or six, eight weeks and, and you get a sense of it. And, and in that survey, which I'm hoping some of you filled out, um, so thank you for anyone who did fill it out, uh, we use branching questions to tailor your response as you go through the, through the survey um, in order to gather, keep it shorter, but also so people don't lose interest, but also to gather relevant in information. The other thing which was important about that survey was the gathering of equalities data. For the, not for the first time, because the Traditional Music Forum has gathered equalities data before for their census, uh, particularly if you think about the 1516 one uh, and other things as well. But this would be the first time that we would have um, equalities data across that ties into the census in Scotland, which at some point we hope will be published for the 2011 census at least anyway. Um, so, in answering that question, the first thing I want to talk about is class. Um, now, this, you, those of you on Zoom definitely will not be able to, to read that. I think some of you in the room might be able to read it. Um, but essentially, um, Ryan, hello? Just to say that we're not seeing the slides moving on, we're only seeing the first slide. Ah, yeah. can fix that, Ryan. And could you put it in slideshow as well, because they, that would make the pictures a bit bigger for us. We see your side strip a whole lot, but but only one first frame. Really? Okay, thanks, Margaret. Uh, you want to unshare so you're the seeing picture? What you're seeing, the, just the very first one, that, that, that page of the International Museum at the Time of Crisis. Yeah. That's all. So in slideshow, if you play from the start, we might get a whole bunch of them, one after the other. Okay. Right, I'll have a go at that then. New slideshow. Right, while, while, we're, while we're chatting, could I ask uh, if everybody who's not presenting or chatting could put, go on mute because there's a bit of kind of background breathing, um, which, you know, can can you guys on Zoom see a slide that says class at the moment? Yeah, got it now. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring up my own um, 
PowerPoint on my own computer because I, I tend to use presenter view and therefore all my notes are in the uh, presenter view bit for it. So I'll just bring that up um, so I can actually talk mildly coherently as we move through. Um, but essentially this slide is about class. Now the only data that we've got on class um, in traditional Scottish music is the data from a survey I did in 2014. Um, and like a lot of social uh, scientists, they tend to use educational uh, qualifications as, um, as a proxy for social class. And if you think about social class in Scotland, at the 2011 census, what you have is about a quarter of the population with an undergraduate degree. Okay? So, that, that means that 70, roughly, well, 74% of Scots don't actually have an undergraduate degree, but about a quarter do. Um, now, if you think about the, the data that I gathered in 2014, what we have here shows that 76% of those of the 273 surveyed had a university degree or a higher degree, um, which really actually is, is kind of a bit astonishing when you think about it. So traditional music has, I mean, there's more data than that we could talk about, but essentially the point is um, traditional music is absolutely awash with well-educated people. In fact, um, there's 29% in that survey had a higher postgraduate degree. So the, the whole, the whole uh, genre is, is, I don't know the answer to this question, but potentially the most well-educated musical genre in Scotland um, and that co that's great because it means that people are literate, digitally literate and stuff, that stuff. Um, can I come back to it? Yeah, it's, it's an important question and understanding the data you're giving us. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'm just concerned that how was it surveyed? Was it online? Because it's been shown that often online users are better educated. Doesn't necessarily mean they're the ones that are actually doing things. Sure, they are. I'm just a bit concerned that we may be looking at things that are people are well educated if they're, they're more likely to be online. That's what we're knowing about that. I'm concerned that there are a lot of people who do traditional arts that are not being counted because we're not talking to them through mediums in which they operate. I, I, so I, can I just, I just want to say that we I may... I totally agree, and actually that would be a really good place to have a conversation today. Yes, yeah. About the gathering data. Yes, that was online. Yes, the one this year was online. There is availability bias for those people, you know, so... Yes. Sorry, I'm, just, I'm just saying... Yeah, like, I think you're right about that. Sending out people with paper surveys is extremely difficult, but it could be done. I'm, I'm yeah. just saying it's easy to do it. It could be done, and, and I, would, I would agree with that. I, we don't need to beat ourselves up for a start. <laughs> so, um, in that sense, that's all I'm going to say about that. But uh, think about also the situation um, for children. You know, how do children get access to traditional music? How do they learn? Well, what we're seeing, I think, is an increasing burden, a financial burden, on uh, parents particularly um, and we know that during COVID there was a really big uneven impact. Adults found the digital pivot a lot easier than children and so all the data we've got not just from Scotland and this survey that I did but also in England and right across uh, all of the, the impact studies from COVID shows that there's a really uneven impact. Adult learners found it much more uh, simple to, to get online um, lessons, be part of a social life online. And that means, um, I think, that there's been a really significant problem recruiting children into traditional music since COVID and obviously during COVID, but even since COVID. Um, and when you talk to people, as we did uh, during interview, you find that they've not recovered. So many of the organizations in, that teach traditional music have not now recovered back. Access to schools, for instance, is a big problem. Many of the schools were simply on overly zealous public health grounds are not allowing tutors back into their schools. So there's a real issue there. Um, and I think the costs have increased too. Transport costs to get your kids to their fiddle lesson Instrument costs, obviously, there's instrument loan schemes, things like that. 
But if you think about it, you want them to proceed, you have then accommodation costs, you've got fuel costs, you start to have uniform costs in some, in some instances. There's also a major time cost as well for parents. Um, and, and, and particularly now that we're in a situation in the UK where there's 32 types of families in the UK, according to the latest census data, we're not in a situation where the, there's many, many households with one parent in them, is what I'm trying to say. Um, and also, one of the big issues, I think, for me, is that venues for kids to access music and in song are very often pubs. And they're totally inappropriate venues for kids to access. And there has been this monetization of community uh, venues. So community halls, libraries are now paid to access, many of them, and just generally the spaces that people want to use. Um, moving on to consider gender, it's very clear the evidence in this survey this year is that women outnumber men at every single stage in traditional music. Um, so there's roughly, um, for, well, for traditional music itself, it's more balanced than that. It's about 53% female in this survey and 46% male. But so there's still a, an imbalance there, but generally it's not so bad as it looks in this chart, which is the whole of Scottish traditional arts considered together. Um, so th there's not really a lot to say about that, other than the fact that the idea of recruiting young boys into traditional music is something that needs special attention um, as well. And I think retaining young boys as well, um, especially as kids move through and past puberty, is a particularly um, interesting issue, I think, for us to consider in today. The biggest issue, I think, though, uh, in terms of the crisis, is ageing for traditional music. It's not just ageing in terms of participants, it's ageing in terms of audiences as well. Um, so there's an ageing profile um, uh, of participants and audiences, and the survey I did showed that almost half of all respondents are over the age of 55. Um, now, that's I mean, to be expected in some respects, given the, the demographics of those people that first became engaged in traditional music during the instrumental revivals of the 70s and 80s. But I think the issue here is that what's happened to their children is the issue here, where some of them are heavily involved in traditional music, but many of them aren't. Um, and there's an issue also about um, just the general recruitment of children and young adults into traditional music. So that is also set in a context where the Scottish government is now saying that um, there will be a 71% increase in people aged over 75 in the next 25 years. So the government is preparing for a massive increase in costs related to aging at the moment. Um, and what we see, particularly in rural communities, is a dwindling working age population as well. So there's a real issue here for traditional music. 14 of the rural local authorities in Scotland, 32, face depopulation, significant depopulation over the next 10 years. Um, and that's all freely available at information on Scottish government websites. Um, and of course, that combined with the impact of the pandemic, on recruitment of children into traditional music, I think it makes this probably the key issue, certainly from where I'm sitting, is the key issue is recruiting kids into traditional music for the next five years, ten years. Um, um, and of course, uh, traditional music obviously doesn't reflect the ethnic diversity in Scotland. Not that Scotland is particularly ethnically diverse, uh, it's not, it's one of the whitest parts of the UK. Um, but 96% of the survey respondents were white to the survey. And so that is an issue. Um, it's not just about age, obviously, or gender, but it is also about that. And we need to be, I think we need to recognize that. You can see that profile in the age profile here for the respondents for the survey. There's a massive glut of people um, over the age of 55. 
However, the good news is, I think, <laughs> that once you take up traditional music and song, you stick with it. So, um, you know, three quarters of everybody who I surveyed had been practicing for more than 20 years. So once we've recruited people and the joy of the music, the fun that we have playing and singing, you stay with it and you stay in the tradition and you learn more and you develop more. And more than half of the people I surveyed actually teach. So there's something going on about uh, recruitment, I think, because once we get people really have the bug, then they tend to stay for a long time. They tend to stay for a long time. Um, so the typical traditional musician or singer today is essentially a woman in her 60s who is professional or retired, near retired or retired. They're well off, they're very well off, they're affluent, and they're highly digitally engaged, they're very well educated, um, they're white, and they're generally an independent supporter as well. So that's, that's what we're dealing with in terms of the demographic challenge at the moment. Um, so thinking about a um, really significant aspect as well during response to COVID <coughs> is, uh, is the use of music. And this is an area I think I would like to see more discussion on personally, is the use of music <coughs> for well-being. Um, 76, three quarters of people during the pandemic used Scottish traditional music to, um, uh, well, 83, sorry, to, as a means of support for their own personal well-being. And I think this is an area where we could really see some growth and potential recruitment of new people. Um, and so that's just something to throw into the mix there. Okay, so that's, that's the context. I'm not going to say any more about that because I've got things to say on the other side. Um, so the question that I want to pose to you today for the Traditional Music Forum coming out of the end of this talk is what do you regard as a successful or healthy tradition? What are the markers for us that actually say, yeah, we're doing okay. You know, we've got, we're, we're, we're a healthy tradition. We've got new blood coming in, we've got new people. Um, and there's events, I think, we've not seen festivals close down. We're seeing events and, and teaching and stuff like that all happening. Um, so I think, I think it would be really interesting as an exercise to figure out how we are going to actually measure that. That's what I'd like to see. How do we measure what we regard as a healthy tradition? Um, okay, so moving on just briefly for a short section about, the, I have to say this because this, is, <laughs> this, this basically is an outline of why I think the answer to these questions is not state funding. Okay, now I think the answer to this is not more money, please, from the Creative Scotland or from the Scottish Government. Um, so, what we've got, um, <coughs> is a period of austerity in Scotland, and and this will, this will upset some people, but Scotland is well recognised as having one of the most centralised economies in Western Europe. Okay? That means that unlike, for instance, in other parts like Australia, like in the US, Canada, for instance, other Anglo-American uh, cultures, Scotland and the UK has one of the most centralised approaches to arts in, in the Western world. And the problems that come from that are quite deep and often hidden. So for instance, because, um, because of that, what it tends to favour is professionalised arts. Funding gets delivered to, professional, to professionals rather than community projects. Grassroots is harder to fund in the UK than it is in France, Germany, Portugal, Spain, uh, any of these other European nations who have a lot more funding available, if you like. Um, and so, for instance, you know, the smallest real unit of governance in Scotland is the local authority, and there's 32 of them. And they represent massive distances. Take a, a local authority like Argyle. You've, you've got no urban centre. You've got Campbelltown, Helensburgh, Dunoon, Oban, Loch Gilphead, right across the whole thing. There's no uh, metropolitan centre for that, and the distances are massive, and people are working in isolation across our gap. 
Whereas in, for instance, the UX, where they have, um, which is not a panacea for all our problems, but the model that they use in the US is based upon the team hall principle. And so government, the smallest level of government there is the county. And the reason that America, for instance, has the county is because the county was based upon the maximum distance a team of horses could pull a wagon to the county seat, which means that the money, when it gets distributed in the states, it, state funding rather than federal funding, goes essentially down to units that are much geographically smaller and therefore place, more place-based and easier to do work in. We don't have that here. Um, and there's a really good uh, report, if you're interested, by Duncan McLennan on a Scotland of better places. And it's the, it's the most interesting thing I've read in a long time about place-based uh, place -based work. So we've got a far larger third sector in Scotland, that's charities um, and um, community interest companies and the like, than any other European state. Because they all, Germany, France, Spain, Portugal, Italy, have much higher levels of state funding than we do in Scotland. Between 2010 and 2020, spending control has shifted radically in Scotland from local government to national government. That is, Edinburgh has taken money out of the councils and taken it back to, to Edinburgh to spend. And that's having a massive effect, actually, on local authorities. One of the effects of that is that almost all, I think all, by now, I think all 32 local authorities have devolved out all public control of arts and culture funding, libraries and leisure. So all, all which is the biggest silent story in Scotland um, in the last 10 years, and just no coverage of it in the press, which I find astonishing. But almost, I, in, I, I counted up the assets last year, and there's about 600 million pounds of assets have shifted from public control into quasi public private control skills. Counterintuitively, that's actually really good for music. Because if you're in a music department in a local authority, you have zero authority and control. You're the last person to get any money and you're always being asked for budget cuts. So actually, if you look at a case study as I've done of say, for instance, High Life Highland, who are operating music tuition in the Highlands and Islands, they have doubled the number of kids getting access to music education since they came out of local authority control. Um, and so this is a narrative where evidence really counts because it's counterintuitive. That includes traditional music. Um, and, and in some respects, there's a model there for future development outside of state control. Simon, should that, uh, should that be Alios rather than... Yes, I was thinking, Skios. No, Skios is... Um, the councils have actually used Skios because that's a, what's called a Scottish Charitable Incorporated Organisation. Now, a Skio, uh, I mean, we can go into this if you want, but a Skio is better. It's not an Alio. Alio is a broader generalist term, but a Skio is a legal yeah. term, which is essentially... Um, it means that they save business rates, but you can employ people. So it's like having a business that operating in Scotland with charitable uh, concern that doesn't have to pay 20% business rates. That's why the if you look at things like, uh, you know, um, all of the skills, the, the leisure companies and the culture services, they've all gone into skills um, because you can have employees and pay pensions, but you, you save 20%. In fact, I talked to one economic officer at one of the councils, and she said to me, I won't name the council, but she said, in 2016, the decision was, we either form a skill for the sports centres and the culture and the leisure, or we make redundant 60 staff this year. That's the level of funding withdrawal that you've got from Edinburgh for local authorities. In fact... Um, Let's name the council. Uh, it's weird. So CEOs aren't allowed to be controlled. My view is that you've essentially got uh, disempowerment at local government level. That's a graph. That's the most cited graph that you see from the um, the Scottish Parliament Information Centre, um, and it's it's one of the most widely used graphs because what it shows is just how much money has drifted um, from uh, 
from local authorities back into central central government. So all of this essentially means, and this is the point, I suppose this is the overall point, all of this means that arts and leisure are now income generating domains for local authorities rather than public goods in Scotland. And there's been a completely silent transfer. So music in its relationship to the state has become a private good rather than a public good. And there's no getting around that um, unless you reversed that kind of uh, that kind of action. If you look also, um, just before I move on to solutions, um, if you think about how um, it's done elsewhere as well, um, what we find is that in Scotland we've got way more charities and voluntary organisations supporting music education than elsewhere. Ireland has an unusual situation, it's largely a private market for music education. The Nordic countries, often touted as being the model for Scotland in all sorts of economic ways, have a, a totally un, uh, untranslatable um, way of doing things because there's so much money uh, floating around in the Nordic model from, from state support from oil, essentially. So I, I, I generally wince when people talk about Nordic models for Scotland, but particularly in relation to arts funding, it simply is not translatable um, because they have their sovereign wealth funds. Um, so all of this is to say uh, that, in my view, solutions for access will not come from the state. They have to come from people like the Traditional Music Forum. So, possible futures. <laughs> okay, um, that's all about doom and gloom. <laughs> the, um, now I want to consider some of, the, some of the ways in which we might start to think about this. If you think about what needs to be done, my view is that we need massively increased access to traditional music for free, if ideally, or very low cost, and massively increased age diversity. If we don't do this over the next 10 years, this is, I think, what will happen. You'll have fewer traditional musicians and singers. You'd have smaller audiences as the audience dies. You're going to have less funding as well, because there's less of an argument with fewer participants for funding if you're talking about state funding. You're going to have greater homogeneity, musically risk averse, I think. That's arguable. What I would call a binding of tradition. Um, less public visibility, reductions in school participation, um, uh, less media, fewer festivals, sessions and events, and audience in general, general genre decline. That's what we don't want. Um, if you increase the access, but you remain an aging tradition, this is what I think happens. You've seen, you can see this in some other um, in some other events, as you get more events, greater public subsidy typically, um, but you get less transmission of the tradition because there's an aging population of people involved. You get musical conservatism thriving in that environment, um, and you get a significant risk to the visibility of an audience decline um, and essentially an unsustainable future. If you increase, on the other hand, diversity, i.e. younger people coming in, kids and adults, but you have decreasing access, i.e. it becomes more expensive to access traditional music, then you end up in a situation which, in some respects, you could say Highland Piping is in. I think it's quite a good example of this, where you've got increasing numbers of kids involved, um, but only within narrow social groups that can afford to participate. Um, Obviously, there's exceptions to that, um, but you've got a class consolidation and a narrowing of opportunity. You've got increasing musical conservatism, audience decline. Go to any piping competition, see if there is an audience. <laughs> Generally, isn't. Um, increasingly zealous gatekeepers to the tradition, which is actually quite significant. People saying this is only for these types of people and you can be in, you can't be in. 
Um, and professionalization then becomes really the only route for people to really develop <coughs> their trajectory if you're younger. Um, and what we want is diversity, I think, away from just one route, which is professionalization. <coughs> you know, we need more amateurs in traditional music. And then you get the terminal decline of amateur and community groups and the risk of media and public decline. Mm -hmm. The Halvala scenario is where you have increasing diversity of age and gender and so on and the qualities, but you also have increasing access. It becomes easier to get people to join and stay in the tradition. So there, in that situation, you have more diversity larger community of musicians and singers, more audiences, bigger audiences, more funding becomes available because your critical mass improves. You have more innovation musically, I think, the living tradition. You have increased schools participation, higher numbers of kids participating, a more sustainable festival and events calendar, audience growth, um, safeguarding of the tradition in other ways, in terms of archival um, things, projects and stuff, so on. And you have more cohesion between amateur and professional groups, I think, and a much more sustainable future in the end. So that's where I would like to see things going. Um, now, um, there are examples of that, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into that particularly. So I'm drawing to a close here, so we'll be finishing soon. Um, these are the four principles I think are absolutely key for traditional music. Recruitment of musicians and singers. The demographic challenge, addressing the demographic challenge. Free to access venues and events and sessions, ideally not in pubs. And increasing diversity. We really desperately need more diversity in, in traditional music. Um, because that's where strength comes from, and that's well documented across all, all the literatures. And I think the way to do it is to use the music itself, you know, use the music that we all love to reinvent access to Scottish traditional music for a new age. Um, and that also, using the music itself and the singing, removes the possible problems of exclusion, etc., by race, gender, age and ethnicity. So the focus for me needs to be on free to practice, free to learn um, activities and simultaneously having a professional sector that are getting paid well for doing valuable events at the elite level. But you can't, you can't have the professional sector if you don't have the amateur sector alongside it. Um, so possible actions, um, and this is my final slide. So after all of that, sort of discussion, um, you know, I thought, well, I can't go up to Perth and just say all that and then not, not have any ideas, you know. So here's some ideas. Um, so uh, here's ways I think this could be achieved. You could have a targeted approach to working with um, uh, <laughs> multiple deprivation years, multiple de Scottish index of multiple deprivation schools. If you click that link, when we get it up online, you'll see that link takes you to a map of Scottish uh, areas of multiple deprivation. So we should be in the schools in those areas, you know? We should be in Drumree, Yoker, Gallowhill, and Springburn. Those are all in the top 10% most deprived areas in Scotland. In Inverness, Merkinch, and Ray Moore, we should be in those schools, you know? Primary schools, ideally. We should be in Perth and Letham and Muirton in Perth, and we should be in those schools too. Uh, and I think, you know, um, there's lots of other things we could do. We should have free community family sessions through the winter. So families don't need to pay. They can come along with their kids and it can be in a pub. It needs to be somewhere that they can get into. We could have subsidized traditional arts fairs focusing on amateur regional traditions. Some of that happens already, actually. So, um, you know, seen through the, um, the, 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 what's the project called that, that uh, tracks runs across the people's parish yeah that, that's already begun in some respects but that could be widened you could have a parents ngo governance is a critical solution to this but if the parents own the organization then it's going to thrive 
That's what the evidence says from else other way. Parents have to be involved. You need an intergenerational program for passing it on. There's lots of lonely old people in Scotland, and some of them are experts in traditional music. Um, and having an intergenerational program really could help actually opening those people up uh, and, and helping them to pass on what they know, songs, tunes, um, technique. A non-economic program events coordinated by local volunteers. That's about local groups doing stuff without any money involved. But that needs facilitation. So whether the leadership for that comes from TMF or from somewhere else, that's fine. But that's what I would be looking to encourage. We could have a directory of teachers across Scottish traditional music that were voluntary or paid. And there's questions there over who gets to be a teacher and how do you qualify to be a teacher on this directory, which would need working out. Um, in some respects, we <coughs> with the, the directory of musicians and so on. Um, there's also this sense of a focus on togetherness in music rather than elitism. And that goes particularly to formal training of musicians. Um, and speaking as somebody who's taught on music degrees for 20 years, um, it's a really difficult challenge, this, but it is doable. You can have social prescribing of Scottish traditional music for mental well-being. We've already seen social prescribing in England for music in, with people with mental health difficulties or people actually suffering from depression or anxiety. Uh, and there's no reason why we couldn't have a really interesting relationship with, uh, with the NHS for social prescribing of Scottish traditional music, particularly given how, how much we know it helps during the pandemic. The big session, what's the big session? I'll, I'll leave it open to you, but we should have, we could have one, a big session, uh, annually, every year, massive media coverage, amateur groups emphasized over elites and professionals, um, uh, and all that sort of thing, focus on place. We need to restructure music degrees, I think, to enable place-based participatory ethos. That's something that people like me need to worry about. Um, but it's, it's absolutely clear to me that um, where traditional music has entered the academy, it has been on a conservatoire model, traditional model, which is basically about elite performance. We could have a hypothecated tourist tax for local arts and cultures across all 32 local authorities. So the discussions about this in Edinburgh got quite far along and then were stymied by local businesses in Edinburgh. But in, say for instance, in Asheville in North Carolina, they, they come away with $20 million a year generated by a bed tax from tourists in North Carolina. And they spend all of that money on arts education and facilities for tourists. So it's a non-state, essentially, state needs to do the legislation, but it's a non-state solution because it's using the sector, the tourism sectors to support and subsidize the grassroots and the arts. It's a, it's a great idea, the, the bedroom tax and the tourist tax. We need more free to access community venues without alcohol. So we need, you know, talk, we should be in conversation with the scouts, the girl guides, food banks, all these people, these groups, we should be thinking about how can we coordinate with them to get traditional music into their venues. We, the time would be right, in my view, for a new People's Festival. The ethos of the original People's Festival back in 1951, 53, um, is something that's been much talked about. Um, but my view is that it's it, the time is right for a new People's Festival, particularly when you see the debates surrounding the Edinburgh Festival and the Fringe over the last year. Um, so I, th I think there's, there's definitely political uh, benefit to that as well. We need a toolkit for safe house keelies. People are so worried about, um, they're so scared of the bureaucracy surrounding this. You know, people are worried about health and safety. They're worried about registers. Um, they're worried about uh, checks. You know, they're worried about abuse. 
all of that stuff is really difficult, particularly when you want to work with kids. So a professionally developed toolkit that actually gives ordinary citizens the, the tools by which to organize a free house Kayleigh would be a great thing, I think. And I think also um, there's other places we should be looking for money. It's already happening. The, the wind farms that have been set up in Scotland by law have to have a place-based fund. So in Argyle, we see the wind farms subsidizing music tuition in Argyle. That's already happening. But we should be lobbying for legislation for that to happen across all local authorities <coughs> and all of these uh, wind farms and, and uh, wave farms as well. These big energy suppliers should be dedicating a ring-fenced fund for local arts or, uh, and culture in, in the area in which those are placed. Um, and that's it. I want to say thanks particularly to David for inviting me and thanks for everybody for, for listening to what was a bit more of a polemic rather than that, rather than the talk. But it's really great to be here and I'm looking forward to the rest of the day. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Simon, for that extremely, uh, extremely provocative <laughs> talk. I mean that in a good way. And uh, there's a, a lot there. And of course, one of the things I'm going to be doing this afternoon is, uh, is looking at what might be the priorities for the TMF in the short to medium term. So that was a, a, an excellent primer for that. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes to uh, for a, a wee bit of uh, discussion around that and uh, as I say we can we can carry that discussion on uh, this afternoon but in, in the meantime anyway we get any any points there's a, a lot of the issues that Simon brought up there that are you know directly uh, uh, affect you know many of you in the room uh, and online through your own your own projects and your own uh, organizations. Um, I was thinking in particular about the, the, the question of access for, for less well-off children. I know, Sheila, that that's something that you're very concerned with. Yeah, I mean, I, I live in the Borders and we run a wee group called Little Fiddles and we are in the exact places you're saying. Um, the issues are even uh, publicly funded hubs still charge £50 for two hours when 